Our next guest uh, says that he really isn't interested in these IPOs. In fact, he generally just stay away. Let's find out if the uh, latest Chinese listings made any impression on Ten Tung Bu. He manages the I Capital Global Fund, which uh, invests in stocks all over the world. In fact, uh, it's been benchmarked by more than 40 percentage points since its inception back in 2007. And Ten Tung Bu joins us from our Sydney studios this morning. Good morning to you, Ten Tung. How are you today? All right. Good morning to you as well. I'm fine. Okay. Excellent, Tantung. Let's get into our discussion about these IPOs because uh, a lot of people are saying this China Metallurgical is turning out to be a big disappointment, down 13 <laughs> percent. Uh, how do you mm -hmm. see things? Uh, well, generally, we don't pay much attention to IPOs as uh, investment potentials. I think you really got to let the company or the business perform for multiple years uh, before one can be comfortable with management, with the economics of the business. So when it comes to IPO, whether it's China, whether it's US or Australia for that matter, uh, we really like to be very patient and just wait and see. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of people said that China Metallurgical, also Sinopharm, really was greedy in terms of their pricing at around 20 to 25 times of forward PE earnings. Let me just ask you, despite these rich valuations, we're seeing some huge demand 600 times oversubscribed for uh, some of these mm -hmm. stocks. What does this really tell you about the overall market in China and Hong Kong? Uh, nothing much, uh, except for the fact that I think confidence has come back somewhat. Uh, in that sense, that's good. I think valuations for most IPO, you've got to take it with a bit of uh, John D's eye. Uh, I mean, anywhere in the world, really. IPOs are what? IPOs are companies that have been trying to get uh, listings for quite a while. And inevitably, you try to uh, make your company look better, you try to make your, your earnings look better, and so on. So I think uh, my, my, my level of cynicism is probably higher for IPOs than uh, other listed companies. <laughs> Okay, well, with this oversubscription and these high valuations and this mm -hmm. frenzy just mm -hmm. to get in, does it indicate to you mm -hmm. that maybe China and Hong Kong are possibly at bubble conditions? Oh, I don't, I don't think so. I think uh, the fact that there's such a huge amount of oversubscription in these particular circumstances uh, should be welcome. I think what we had after the collapse of Lehman Brothers last year uh, was not a collapse in anything except collapse in confidence uh, across uh, credit markets, across the uh, business community. So this is, I suppose, a indirect a circumstantial evidence that uh, the confidence has res been restored to levels that are more normal. And in that sense, I would not see it as a bubble, but as a reassuring sign. Yeah, but uh, Ten Tung, you know, valuations are, aren't cheap these days. If you're looking at maybe 17 <laughs> times uh, earnings, PE mm -hmm. is the average on the Hang Seng, maybe 20 something for the Shanghai Composite. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me just ask you for these two markets, what are you interested in? Are you even interested in buying any stocks right now, either in uh, Shanghai or Hong Kong? Yes, yes, certainly. Uh, I think the sell down, the plunge uh, after September 0, it was so severe that. Despite the fact that many counters have gone up 50, 100, 200 percent, uh, some of them are still selling at pretty uh, decent valuations. I think when you talk about valuations, one has got to be careful because if you are uh, talking about just this year's earnings or next year's earnings, the impression could be a bit distorted. Uh, in our case, when we look at valuation, we look at uh, the longer term valuation, meaning you take the good years and the bad years and try to adjust them for what we reckon would be a, no, a more normalized type of uh, circumstances. So mm -hmm. if you also look at the assumptions, a lot of people assume that uh, growth is going to be non-existent or earnings growth may not be as strong as what is expected. So I think one has to examine the assumptions very carefully because you might get a situation where the recovery is really V-shaped and the earnings recovery could be much stronger than uh, what has been anticipated. Then valuations become okay. uh, a more, well, more attractive again. Yeah, well, Tan Tang, you must believe in this recovery because you're 97% invested, pretty much fully invested 
uh, at yes. this point with your long only fund. So let's talk about some of the adjustments that you've made recently in your portfolio and start off first uh, with Porsche. Uh, you actually mm -hmm. added to your position in this luxury sports car maker, even though, mm -hmm. you know, we heard about this uh, this battle with Volkswagen uh, making headlines. Mm -hmm. It's also mired in 10 billion euros in debt uh, after that takeover, that really bitter takeover battle, some would say. Why do you continue to add uh, Porsche to your portfolio? I mean, sure, valuations look cheap, but uh, is that enough to offset all the risks that we talked about? Uh, I think the takeover of Volkswagen or the, the strategy to take over Volkswagen uh, was pretty all right from a business standpoint. Uh, I think it's the way they financed it that went wrong. But mm -hmm. what happened was investors generally got distracted by the fact that if you look at the uh, business of Porsche on its own, uh, it is still very attractive. Uh, I think one shouldn't look at Porsche as another car maker. It is not definitely a GM, it's not a, another uh, Ford or something like that. It is a brand. And I think one has to look at uh, Porsche from an iconic brand. And if you look at it, I think the brand of Porsche is extremely powerful, extremely strong, not just in the developed markets, but more importantly, in the developing markets. Uh, if you look at the sales of Porsche in China four or five years ago, uh, they were almost non-existent. And by, say, the financial year of 08, sales of Porsche in China touched about 8,000 units, which is not too far off from the UK or the German markets. Okay, well, Tan Tung, you know, what's going to happen with Porsche? I mean, is this merger with Volkswagen going to go through? I mean, there's also indications and speculation that Porsche might be taken mm. private even and, and delisted eventually. I mean, these are some pretty big risks, don't you think? What does this mean for shareholders like yourself? Yeah, there are quite a wide range of uh, possibilities, but I don't think it will make sense to delist Porsche. Uh, I think the uh, combination, the way uh, Porsche and Volkswagen will be combined will be such that uh, Porsche would definitely have to stand as a brand of, on its own. And I think the uh, recent uh, participation by the Qatar Holdings and the recent uh, rescue, if you could call it, uh, by Volkswagen of Porsche, I think that has set the stage for the recovery of Porsche as, uh, as a financial group. Okay, Tan Tung, we have about a minute left before a commercial break, but, uh, you know, Chinese automakers have been in focus, especially with Warren Buffett investing, mm -hmm. Goldman Sachs yesterday boosting mm -hmm. Geely. Why don't you want to get exposure to Chinese automakers, which seem to have bigger returns? I think BYD is a different animal altogether. Uh, uh, they are not really an automaker originally, but I think the expansion, the uh, strategies taken by BYD illustrate the worries that we have with regards to the uh, with regards to investing in Chinese auto stocks. You know, a few years ago, BYD was just a battery maker, and it came uh -huh. from nowhere, and now it's considered as a serious electric car maker. So you okay, have... Okay, well, Tan Tang, we have to get to commercial break, uh, but well, let's continue this discussion afterwards. Sure. Uh, we're talking to Tan Tang Bu of uh, iGlobal Capital, or iCapital Global. We'll have him after this break. Stay with us. Now let's get back to our discussion with our guest this morning. And Tan Tung Bu rejoins us from Sydney. He operates the iCapital Global Fund, which has uh, beaten its peers or the benchmarks by 40 percentage points uh, since its inception. And Tan Tung, it's uh, basically a long only fund. And as you said, it has a very conservative strategy. Why don't you think about investing maybe in derivatives and, and doing some shorting in the future? Uh, for shorting, I think it's more of uh, social reasons in the sense that. Uh, you know, recently the uh, chief of Goldman Sachs described some of these products as uh, not valuable from a society's point of view. So we, we take the same stance. And I think in the case of derivatives, uh, we, we just want to know where our risks are when we invest. And we just want to know that we have very limited downside risk. And in the case of derivatives, sometimes, as events in 08 have shown, uh, nobody really know where the risks are. Uh, I think right. our philosophy is really low. Our risk, is really our profile is low risk, high return, really. Yeah, I think everyone's looking for low risk, at high return these days, Tantum. But where do you find it? I mean, where do you find these stocks? You're looking at Citigroup right now. You're trying to do some due, due diligence to see if Citigroup uh, is <laughs> worth investing in. I mean, isn't that 
high risk? Well, I think that is where uh, the quality of the research comes in, really. I think everything has uh, value, everything has a price. And if we can do our homework correctly, and we have done the evaluation correctly, and if the price justifies uh, the risk that we should take, then we will take it. But uh, having said that, I think uh, investments like uh, Citigroup and all that are not simple. Uh, there are a lot of mm -hmm. uh, not just company uh, factors. You have to look at the macroeconomic picture and so on. So I think the, the bottom line is that we have to be comfortable with the valuation that we arrived at. Well, let me ask you this. What valuation would you invest in Citigroup at? I'm, I'm taking a look at its debt to equity, return on equity. It has a negative 32% mm -hmm. return on equity, also pretty high gearing as well. So what would make Citi, what levels would make Citi compelling as an investment to you? We have not reached that stage yet, uh, Susan. <laughs> but just to share with you, we traditionally... I'm very averse, I'm, I shy away from uh, banking shares traditionally. But you have a crisis that happens only once in a generation and uh, very established names have been very badly affected. So I think it is certainly also an opportunity that happens very rarely. And I would definitely want to do a lot of work, a lot of research into this before we mm -hmm. actually make a decision. But we have invested in a small Swiss bank, uh, which has done extremely well in the last uh, 12 to 18 months. And you're not worried about the capital levels at these banks? You know, we had the CLSA's uh, Mayo coming out saying that he is quite concerned about capital uh, levels for, for banks globally. And he expects another collapse, another corporate collapse, such as uh, on the scale of Enron and WorldCom before this uh, cycle is done. Yeah, yeah you, can't, you can't deny a lot of the... Uh, problems that you have raised, which is why uh, we have been looking at Citigroup for the last, what, 11 months or so, and we have still not made any decision yet. Okay, what about Toll Brothers? Because uh, that's another potential investment uh, for mm. you as well, but uh, analysts that we surveyed on the Bloomberg system actually expects Toll Brothers to post losses through the next year. How attractive are its valuations right now? I mean, how compelled are you to buy into this stock? Um, in terms of downside probably you don't see much uh, but in terms of outside I think it probably be not so exciting in the case of Toll Brothers compared with say Pulte or Lena and all that we like Toll Brothers more than the others for the simple fact that they are in the higher segment of the uh, real estate market and that segment probably would be uh, able to recover much faster than the mass market segment and on top of that uh, Toll Brothers has got a pretty strong balance sheet but uh, the upside would not be that attractive, I guess, compared with other stocks that we're looking at. Okay, well, let me just ask you, what about these gaming stocks? Uh, are they attractive to you, such as Las Vegas Sands and Galaxy Entertainment? Uh, you mentioned those two are maybe also possible investments. Yeah, I think the upside for uh, the casino stocks are much more exciting in the sense that because they got exposure uh, to Macau and in the case of uh, Sands, they've got exposure to Singapore as well. So in that sense, the reliance on the U.S. Uh, consumer market is not as great as in the case of Seto Brothers. So I think if you are able to take a longer term view, meaning uh, the next couple of years, uh, you find that the upside should be much more uh, attractive than Seto Brothers. Yeah, well, Tantan, let me, I'm taking a look at the uh, year-to-date performance of Las Vegas Sands, Galaxy Entertainment, both triple-digit gains so far, over 200%. <laughs> I mean, if you invest in now, I mean, how much do you want to reap from these, uh, these stocks? What's the risk-reward here? Susan, your questions are really very good questions. Unfortunately, I have no answers to them. I mean, I wish I could <laughs> say that, oh, great, you know, the returns are going to be five times. Uh, but I think the... the the uh, whole situation for the casino stocks is quite similar in the sense to Citigroup because uh, they face a lot of, uh, in the case of, uh, say, MGM or Vegas Sands, they face a lot of debts and they must be able to make sure that their new projects uh, mm -hmm. come on stream at the right time and cash flow generating and therefore they're able to handle their debt positions uh, the next one or two years. So that is something uh, that is very tricky. Okay. All right, Tantang, you have to do your due diligence. Uh, good luck on that. Thank you for joining us Thank this you. morning. That's uh, Tantang Boo of I Capital Global Fund.